Chevy Smith, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm great. You have such an interesting background. Um, you're Emmy winning, Emmy, Emmy award winning, I should say, composer, singer, songwriter, music educator, app developer. Um, lots going I'm on. I'm actually only Emmy nominated. Just like I'm not, oh. I, I didn't win, but you know. Okay, uh, we, we won't, we won't, won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, you know what? Even to be nominated is amazing because that's, that's uh, an elite club for sure. Um, so you have an interesting background. Um, you're, like I said, singer, songwriter, composer. You had a publishing deal, actually. And I should say you're in Nashville now. I but am, um, yeah. you had a publishing deal at a very young age um, in Nashville. Tell me about how you got into music and how that happened. Yeah, well, uh, kind of like everybody, it was it, one of those I could not not do it. I, I loved it. I started playing piano when I was very young. I was about four and uh, picked up a guitar, I guess, around 10 years old and immediately gravitated towards writing my own songs. You know, I had I kind of seen um, there was this artist um, out of Nashville at the time named Matresa Berg, who right. wrote a yep. it. Um, and she was my first concert I ever saw. So the first conception I had of music was that this like beautiful woman stood on stage and played and sang her songs. Um, and I just knew that like, whatever that is, that's, that's what I'm about. And so I uh, started writing and I grew up uh, on a ranch in Kansas. Um, and so, you know, not a lot of outside influences. I would kind of ride my, my horse around and make up songs. And then I would come back and I didn't have a four track recorder. I had um, just two clock radios. So I would kind of dub back and forth between those two things, uh, trying to produce my own little records essentially. And so around, I guess, 15 years old, that found its way to um, the super legitimate producer out of New York uh, who had written the Dirty Dancing songs. And so, wow. you know, he was just really well established and just a, a wonderful producer and really a, a guiding light in my life then and and still you know we're still friends now but uh he really liked my songs and so next thing I knew I was I was flying to New York and you know like my first um session was in the Philip Glass studios and G.E. Smith was the guitar player and Sean Pelton was the drummer and and so uh it all kind of you know I didn't know at the time, that's not how it happened, but it was, uh, you know, it was you pretty, definitely had a guardian, you had a guardian angel. Yeah, no, I really, I really did. And, and I kind of got in so young that I had, you know, a lot of, um, my experience has been that the older people were very protective of me, um, rather than predatory. So I, I really lucked right. out in, in that sense. And so just immediately had, had smart people around me. I've, always been a reader so I like at one point I'd read all the books in the local library like 111 books on everybody's biography and how they did it and you know just trying to figure out the ways that you get from a field in Kansas to to be able to make your albums and and you know be able to make music and so I was really fortunate um that project ended up um I ended up working with this attorney uh named Rosemary Carroll who was you know representing like Patty's Patty Smith, uh, Chrissy Hinn, you know, Regina Spector, Lucinda Williams, like all, I mean, she just had a real roster of, of kind of all of my heroes. And she uh, sent it down to Nashville. And I ended up getting record interest for sure, but really the publishers reacted. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote a lot by myself and it was just kind of, you know, this, I, I was kind of just this odd odd little kid you know um and so i and what, what's amazing what's amazing about that is a lot of people don't realize that the money in the music business is publishing so <laughs> yeah. it's like great to be an artist but if you're not writing your own songs you're not getting that's really where yeah, the gold I is i didn't realize that either like uh throughout throughout the path i wish i you know was more motivated uh by by following the money i didn't really know that i just knew that um i thought in songs and i you know Kind of spoken songs and that right. was that was what I that was what I knew you know so um so yes yeah, so I ended up moving down here I was like 17 18 got a little apartment um and started working with some some great writers here I, I wrote with Liz Rose a ton um you know got to really work like this guy Tim Krakel was hugely influential and just got to write with these really amazing writers who really were 
you know, guiding forces. And yeah, uh, that's awesome. And it's nice to have them as mentors. Like you said, you're, <laughs> you're a young, a young woman in that industry and also in Nashville or LA can be very challenging, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think also, I mean, like I grew up with all brothers and, you know, kind of out, um, where it's a little rougher. So I was also pretty tough, you know? I mean, it was like, yeah. a, it protective and also um, I think getting into it so early, you just kind of like, you know, you got your dukes up a little bit. Yeah, that's good though. You need, you need, a, you need a little bit of a toughness. It, it's, it's, I mean, you know, I'm a musician too, as we, we were talking about and like, you know, you just, it, no matter how tough you are, it's still, it's hard, it's challenging, right? It is, yeah, you gotta have a sense of humor, a lot of resilience and, and yeah. all that. So a big part of your your um, mission, I, th- I guess I could say, is helping emerging <laughs> artists. So you've developed, um, I think it was uh, with uh, Khalid Jones, you have Elite Shout, you have your education program. Tell me about how that aspect of your career came about. Got it. So I um, went out to LA and by that time I'd done a couple of independent records and I was touring colleges quite extensively. So my agent was was really good at booking shows. So for all of my early 20s, I would play like over 200 shows a year. Wow. By myself. Um, so it was mostly colleges and you'd play one place at lunch and then you'd go, you know, hopefully somewhere reasonably close and play like the, the evening coffee house shows. And so I was just a bit worn out. You know, I've been working since I was, you know, 16 and I loved it, but um, it was, it was also this feeling of like, okay, I've kind of been everywhere. I got to go on USO tours and right. Europe and, and I, you know, was 23 years old and I felt like I was, I was 40. Um, and yeah. you're like, you know, I'm, I'm burned out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, I, I like made a friend who she lived on like in this little surf shack um, in Costa Rica, like on the beach and was like living the movie Blue Crush. And I was like, I'm just watching the movie Blue Crush. I gotta go, I gotta go. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of made a, a, a big, you know, decision and, and left Nashville, went to LA and honestly started getting into producing. I'd always, um, that was one amazing thing about Nashville is I had all of these engineers and my publishers at the time, they would just stick me in the studio. And I mean, we were still recording to like ADAT. So I wasn't right. quite, you know, um, tape, but but it wasn't completely, you know, DAWs and home recording and digital. Digital, stuff. right, yeah. Uh, I was able to learn a lot and glean a lot from those guys. And they were, they were also, they were just very, you know, encouraging. And they were like, no, you're a producer. You think like a producer, you know, like you should do that. And then when I started getting to LA, I, I kind of, started getting asked to do that um, more than uh, than go on the road. And I, I kind of had an accident with some injuries that made it um, difficult for me to tour again. So it just kind of like transitioned naturally into like, this is a place I want to be. I want I want to be able to enjoy the environment around me. And uh, there was the ability to work and produce. So I did, you know, TV and film, um, mostly TV, honestly, like promos. And so it was just really right. like, uh, quick turnaround, you know, like high creativity. Um, yeah, budget. those are like little, little, little 15, 30 second spots, right? Exactly. Yeah. You would have to, I mean, you'd have to figure out something that you could stretch into 60 to 90 seconds, but that you could also do like a six second, like sizzle on. And, right. and more than anything, it's, it was like the turnaround time, you know, like I work really fast. I don't like, you know, deliberating over, um, yeah, you gotta make you gotta make decisions I yeah. drum for like a day, like I'll I'll lose my mind. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I really loved that that I could just kind of and by that time I was home studio and I had, you know, like my my logic set up with my interface and everything. And so I could just just make stuff all day, which is like all I've ever really wanted to do. And, and you know, I had a bunch of instruments and would just just kind of play everything myself. Right. And because these weren't, you know, I wasn't like you know, producing these really intricate records, it was more just making sure that it, it felt good, you know, yeah. um, that, it, that it served the purpose. I think it was really good training ground. And um, I also started just having like little girls in the neighborhood that wanted to learn guitar and it was super fun. So I would write songs with them and it kind of really just took it back to who I was when I started writing songs and I spent, it was, mm-hmm. It was heavenly, you know, like I spent a decade just teaching and, and doing production work and just kind of being 
it's chill, you know? Yeah. Um, so you're that, doing that and then you're, you're kind of realizing that there's a lot of young artists too that want to get into writing, want to get into producing. Exactly. And, and you kind of, you had some great mentors. So you naturally kind of want to mentor people too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I ended up with this amazing roster of all of these girls I've been working with since I, they were eight years old. Now we're like 14, 15, 16 years old. And they were getting, you know, by this time, Instagram's happening. And so they were getting scouted, you know, by other producers and you're like, oh, right. hold up. no, you're, you're my little babies. Like, let's, <laughs> let's, let's make that, you know? So yeah. it also became clear that um, we needed to be able to offer them a, a compelling reason to work with me versus these other opportunities. And so that's the point um, at which I met Khalid and he comes from a background of esports and, you know, innovation kind of around those technologies. And he's an attorney, um, you know, went to Stanford Law School. So he's very well versed right. in the business dealings and had, uh, you know, a private equity firm. And so I definitely knew the things that I did not know well, and he represented all of those. So it really, and, and then also he has a background you know, he had a, had a hip hop deal. He had a rap deal when he, before we ever went to law school. So he was really oh, wow. creative and, you know, writing and, and wordsmithing background and has a respect for it. So the right. partnership has made a lot of sense and pretty early into that, you know, as we started exploring what offers, you know, what options existed for these young artists we were working with, you know, he was looking at it with fresh eyes and being like, this business is bonkers. Like, why is it done this way? This is right. silly, you know? And I think we all know that it's silly, but we just accept that that's the convention. And so we had this little studio and we started having conversations about, you know, how we could create, you know, more of like the rails or the picks and the axes that things run on rather than just the end just result. Hope, yeah. hope for the best right <laughs> exactly. exactly yeah yeah so, so just trying to like figure out like the tools that we want to have exist like is it possible that we could create them and you know we're in the the belly of california and innovation and and tech and you know vc startups and everything so it just um you know like i've definitely been very uh inclined to take a lot of risks in my life you know like a, my whole artistic journey has been a risk and so yeah. it seems well that's that's what's going on right now is people are building apps they're building tech companies so, you know like get me in the game let's do it you know and yeah. so we um i mean and he's brilliant uh just a really really smart um on game theory and you know just it's it's been a really fun process figuring this whole thing out um because the partnership is really cohesive in that way yeah and that's awesome and I, and I was reading about his background which is yeah it's pretty fascinating and it's great i mean it's obviously great to have an attorney as a partner but also somebody that knows the music business like that's the perfect storm right it really is yeah no i i, I lucked out and but i'm old enough to know it you know like i, I exactly yeah uh, there's you know many times throughout the day that you're like phew i'm so glad that i'm like partnered up with with this very smart, very capable um, person, you know, and, and somebody who really has, I mean, he has such a love for music and such a love for artists. And that's what, you know, we, we've ended up partnering with the Arizona Lottery who, you know, made this whole thing fly and everybody right. there loves artists. And so that's kind of been the recurring theme is, um, you know, all of us love making our own stuff, but we really like the idea of a, a healthy artist market out there and, you know, healthy. right. Yeah. And, and I'm the same way. And I think that, you know, especially like you said, young artists, it's just so many, I mean, we all know there's a lot of pitfalls and you want to protect them, especially people that are super talented. Yeah. And like you said, young women, not only young women, but young men as well. It's so easy for them to be taken advantage of. And you just hate to see yeah. that, that story. Um, so that brings us to the ultimate playlist app which is really interesting. I was reading about that um, on your on your bio and the, you have the partnership with the Arizona Lottery, which is, that's awesome. And that's very, oh, they are, that's a very creative thing to, to make that happen. So tell yes. me how that, how that came about. Well, that certainly is the brilliance of Khalid, uh, my business partner. So he, through, through his background and his interesting work, uh, was doing some consulting with the lottery, especially Arizona, but different lotteries and kind of, you know, helping them be creative um, about ways they could reach younger audiences. Right, marketing. And, yep. Yeah. 
So um, we had done several iterations of incentivized listening, you know, basically the gamification of playlists and listening and just trying to figure out how to incentivize listeners to lean forward, to know the artist's name, to look at the artwork, to have an, a connection, because I think we are really in danger of teaching this next generation to only attach to songs and not artists and, you know, only attach right. to not entire songs and and really I think robbing them of a, of a richness of experience and doing that and so we did um like I said a number of iterations you know this is this is definitely iterative and and kind of the the best amalgamation of a lot of ideas but he was the one who was like I think this actually you know if they'd be into it this really solves a problem for the lottery and trying to reach younger users trying to have something mm. that exists online because there's a lot of um compacts within the government and lottery systems that don't allow them to do online right. it's tricky very tricky games. yeah you know so you're really threading a lot of needles and obviously our concern was just creating alternative channels that are are different than just kind of sending your stuff off to playlists you know managers and like hoping for the best and also during that time you know it it went i mean just in the last 18 months it's went from approximately 40,000 songs going to Spotify each day to now 80,000. Awesome. Um, wow. And so when you look at those numbers, you're like, man, if you're not Drake, if you're not Taylor, like there's not even a, you can't go kiss the ring. There's no ring to kiss. It's, there's too many, you right. know? It, right. It's it, too it, many. There's a lot of, there's a lot of noise. That's, that's, the, I mean, it's the same thing with podcasting. There's so much noise out there that your job exactly. is to figure out how do I navigate that? <laughs> well, that, and then, I mean, I'm even, I'm really, I'm, I'm pro now, as far as I think the best music that's ever been made is being made right now. I just think that, you know, the, we used to have a plan and a channel and kind of a, a delivery method when the cream rose to the top, there was a way for that to get recognized. Now it's just madness. You know, there's, so, yeah. we're so fragmented. I think obviously we see it in our news is the way that we really see it manifest that like everybody's in their own little fragmentation of, of a world and it really translates into music is like you you really can't get critical mass right yeah now. Very, i mean the other part of it too as as an artist with with the streaming platforms it's like how do i make a living i mean oh, and, and not only getting your songs heard but then that whole component of like okay now what right no, that that is i mean and you nailed it i think that's that's what it boils down to is like i i don't have any like my lifetime has been spent in the middle class and working class of music. And right. that's all of my friends. That's all of the people that I love. All of my favorite artists, you know, are, are maybe cult artists or, you know, are able to tour at a certain level, but, um, you know, very few are going to become superstars and they're not even trying to do that actually. They're yeah. They're just trying, trying to make a living and survive. Right? Living and yeah. And so um, I think, you know, understanding, how different the economics are now from you know even a decade and a half ago and how they're not trending in the right direction you know just right. really make up your mind to want to create alternative tools and i think if we're really honest with ourselves right now we're, we're telling most artists that you need to you need to create a song that trips the TikTok algorithm in the proper way to give you a chance, a fighting chance at maybe going viral or, right. maybe, you know, even short of that. But I do think perhaps some of the things that we're asking grown adult artists, serious artists to do lack a bit of dignity, you know, or, or just at least don't comport with who they are creatively. You know? Right. Like I don't need, you know, I, I don't, need Florence Welch to be doing a TikTok dance for me. I just want her to go make gorgeous records that, you know, I'm, right. I'm willing to pay for as a fan. And so um, we're certainly not solving that, but I, I hope that we're creating an alternative channel, you know, mm -hmm. we're encouraging people to invest a, a little bit of time and intention in, you know, seeing the artwork as the, as the artists intended them to see and and experiencing the song in its its full form and the way we've 
decided to do that is to incentivize listening. So I guess I haven't really explained what the app is. I was going to um, ask you, so because there is a financial component, which is awesome, the way you guys set uh, that up. So, so talk about how that works. <laughs> okay, so basically, you know, it's an attention economy. And so we reason that one way or another, you're, you're paying to get a chance at people's attention. And so we were kind of like, well, why hide the ball? You know, in the old school, you would pay a program director or an independent promoter, and then right. they would go, go out and push your music. Director, a nice trip. And, you know, and it was kind of all this like massaging everything around. But the bottom line is, is the artist is, is outputting some sort of capital or some sort of resource to try to get their song heard. Um, ours is kind of maybe just cut out the middle guy, you know, like, Let's let's create something that incentivizes the listener to give their time and give their attention for the chance to potentially win cold hard cash. So we have 40 songs a day that go up on the app. The app's completely free to download, completely free to play. Um, it's nationwide, over 18, and you're good to go. If you um, you know download it, create an account, you're served 40 songs at the beginning of each day at midnight. At actually 1205 um and you listen to those songs if you listen to 30 seconds you get a ticket um if you listen to 60 seconds you get a ticket whole song you get three tickets if you rate it um so you weigh in your opinion you get a ticket and if you add it to your apple music playlist you get two tickets and then for every song that you don't skip uh every third song you get another ticket so you can earn up to 333 tickets per day to something called the daily cash drawing. And that's a guaranteed 18 winners win 50 to $500. So that's been a real joy for me to experience what it is that we have 18 people a day who get a gift card in their inbox that- Yeah, it's awesome, right? Thing, you know, just for listening to songs. And we get so much feedback as well of people saying, oh man, I never would have listened to such and such artists, you know, like, especially like cross genre, you know, we'll have somebody be like, I'm, I'm a pop fan. I did not think I like country, but this Tyler Childers song was insane. It moved me, you know? And so right. I think that's really fun. And then we have, um, so there's two games within it. There's the daily cash drawing. And then there's also the ultimate payout, which is a $20,000 jackpot. Um, and if you listen to 30 seconds of 20 of the songs, you get one entry. If you listen to 30 seconds of all three or of all 40, you get two more entries for a total of three. And then yeah. you can pick your like Powerball. And each month that it's not one, it increases $5,000. So right now we're at $25,000 for that one. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I think that's such a brilliant idea. And it's a total rethink of streaming and, and those kind of platforms. Because everybody, I think, you know, obviously Spotify serves a, a good purpose, an important purpose. But at the same time, a lot of times too, the, there's only one kind of one entity making money in that situation exactly. and it's not usually the artists unfortunately no no you nailed it and we're actually um you know our licensing is as is as interactive uh or non-interactive streaming radio so we basically serve up a sample you know we're the costco samplers saying like here's what it's it important tastes like. right and if you like it go over here and buy it and so we right. direct people to listen to it on the Apple platform, you know, they can only listen to it one time on ours and um, they don't get to choose the order of their song or, and they're only allowed to skip six songs per hour. So it really, really does incentivize them to give uh, every song a chance. And that's what our data has really right. uh, laid out is that I can't make anybody like your song, but I can make them listen to it. You know, and that's, you know what, and that's the thing, I'll, everybody just wants a chance to get it out that's there. It. I mean, that's you know, that's, I think, our artist mentality is you're like, man, I think they'd love it if they just heard it, you know, but right. getting heard is a really difficult thing. And the other beautiful part is, I think, you know, we're in such a, a data rich time in, you know, life in society. But if you can't get that data stratified in a usable way, it's really useless to you, you know? So there's a lot of data being accrued over on the Spotify platform, but most artists don't have access to that in a way that they can plan a tour. Or that and they it's usable, right? The their, their promotional budget. So it really gives them a tool that maybe would be reserved for, you know, the darling star child at a 
major label, like now you as your own independent label with maybe, you know, major distribution or whatever, you can do your own market research and right. you can make your own plan um, on how you want to proceed with the song. Also with all these catalog acquisitions, I think, you know, there's a lot of entities that maybe just acquired one catalog or another and they're like- Neil oh, Young or all these other, Bruce Springsteen. Seven. Yeah, I mean, but like even the, you know, the the smaller ones, you know, like I think um, obviously everybody's, you know, mind Petty's catalog or Dylan's catalog or Springsteen, we know all those deep cuts, but I think that there are, there's a tier right below that where, um, you know, there's these these large acquisitions going on of multiple catalogs. And so when somebody goes and listens, they're like, yeah, I think this song from like 1993 should have been a hit. You can, you know, for a very like nominal buy-in, you can test market that and see like, oh right. yeah, it turns out people in the South love this song. Or it turns out, you know, women over 30 in the Northwest love this song. And so it, it just kind of gives everybody a little bit more information um, to make smarter choices because with the right. economics, you got to be real smart. With and you mind. need and you need those those demographics and those numbers because like you said it helps you get signed it helps you get interest from publishers <laughs> and all that kind of stuff if you're getting traction with what you're doing and that's that's a big part that is a big role that spotify has played where people can see like oh they're getting a lot of traction i know they can see the numbers and that that's you know that's also where your site's going to be really useful for a lot of a lot of folks i think absolutely and i think one of the other things that you know spotify can can show that a lot of people maybe have been exposed to your song, but it's possible that it was on a laptop that's sitting across the room and they don't really have a relation to like what your name is or what your artwork looks like. Right. You know, it's, it's just, it's just background so noise. Background, yeah. You know, like lean back uh, listening experience. And so um, one of the things with our anti-automation, you know, you can't, you can't game this, you can't bot this. Like you have to be a real human being located in the United States in right. order to um, engage with it. So it makes our data quite pure. And it also um, means that you're really getting the chance at interacting with a human that could potentially buy a hard ticket to a theater gig. And that's that's what really matters. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's where any the sort of- Rubber hits the road and you can, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, that's super exciting. And I want to, we're going to um, give all your information for the app and everything else, how to find you um, on the episode. Um, I wanted to ask you advice <laughs> to young artists, because that's kind of been your world. Um, yeah. Artists that want to get out there and do it. What What's some of the biggest lessons that you've learned as a, when you started out? Yeah, I think um, really there's, you know, take all the opportunities, like don't think that you're above any opportunity. You know, I played on more hay trailers and, you know, lugged around my own PA and, and that sort of thing. And I think right now um, there's a propensity to spend a lot of time perfecting your 15 or 30 second, you know, TikTok clip, which obviously you need to have that element as well. But I have noticed with a lot of younger artists I work with, it's almost like they're robbing themselves of the the joy of person to person interaction. So I would say get out and play live shows. You know, like that's that's right. really where you get better, and that's also the motivator. You know, that's also like I think if you do it, you're gonna like it. So I would say play play live. Be the best practicer that there is. I see. You know, like I've failed at everything. I've just done a lot of things with a lot of repetition and I happen to really like work. Um, and so right. crack fun and I, you know, I still, you know, like I'm going um, to Columbia uh, next month with my mom. And I just was like, I'm gonna learn some Colombian piano pieces. Like I've never studied, com you know, Colombian composers. And so I'm like making myself practice every day, you know, like hands separate, you know, it's a totally different thing, but I'm, I'm having to practice it as a novice who almost, you know, has never played piano. I'm, I'm approaching it like a beginner. And so I think that's something for young artists. And um, I think be as self-sufficient as possible, you know, build your own little, you know, small business that is you build it up to the point that you have some leverage because when we go into, you know, we talk about all these, these, you know, bad 
feels, but I, I kind of have less sympathy for it now. Like people have been signing bad deals since the fifties. By now we know this business is predatory. Like we right, know exactly right. He, it, there is nobody who doesn't know that that person on the other side of the table is hedging their bets in a way that makes them the most money. So them's just the facts. Like you've got to know that and you can't be naive to that. And if you are, then like, man, you, you're going to have a rough time in life in general. So knowing that that's, you know, the equation, I think be self-responsible, like build your small business so that when you're sitting across that table, you have leverage, you know, that you have experience that you're not sitting there desperate. You're not trying to make easy money, you know, that you really are bringing something to the table. And even if, you know, your, your balance sheet isn't showing that you're making a ton of money, like what they're going to see is that you have yourself together. You know, I, when I was a teenager, I mean, my publishers here who I now just get to be like adult friends with, you know, they like giggle because when I came in as a 16 year old, I had a binder and I had every song I'd ever written printed out, you know, all the like lead sheets and everything was alphabetized. And they were like, all we knew is like, kid is serious about this, you know? So whether I was good or not, which I was not, you know, like you listen back and you're like, you, I've been alive this long. I couldn't be great, you know? And I, I, but what they saw is like, she's not going to stop, you know, she's going to apply herself. And I think um, there's a lot that could be said for that. Cause I work with a bunch of young artists and, it's, you know, the, the nature is to be pretty flaky. So when you, if you want to stand out, like, you know, get, get your own business in order, get your affairs in order and put yourself in a position that you're not at, you know, the, the mercy and that you can say no to whatever you. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing as being a young artist, you're, I mean, first of all, social media, you have to decide if you want to be famous or if you want to be a really good artist. <laughs> and those are not always the same thing. They're not always, I mean, it, but they could be the same thing. You know, like I don't, um, I think, you know, some of the, the people who are, I think we have a great, you know, landscape of artists right now. I think, right. you know, when you, when you hear that, like Justin Vernon, you know, has Bonavera and he has Volcano Fire and he has, you know, was back on Kanye records when that was something that you could do. And, and just like, that's a really, I mean, he's kind of a bizarre artist. He's, you know, like he's a, an interest, he's doing stuff with Taylor, you know, but, right. but he's so amazing and making his weird little records. And they, you know, had, had incredible acclaim, you know, you have, um, I don't know, just any number. I think we're in a really musically rich time. I'm, I worry about the streaming economics of like how many people are going to have to go spend a lot of time doing something else so that they can right. make their records on the side. And so, um, you know, that's more of a concern to me that us as like elders in the business need to need to figure out the mathematics of this whole thing. Yeah. It, it doesn't work out. You know, I, think, I, th I think a lot of the streaming, I mean, it's kind of been talked about a lot, but a lot of the streaming <laughs> platforms got way ahead of, of what had been negotiated just mm -hmm. from the mechanic, you know, from BMI ASCAP. A lot of that just was like, they didn't see that coming, I think, at, at, to the extent. So now they're yeah. trying to play catch up and that's always been the challenge. It's like sort of the cat's already out of the bag. <laughs> so then like, how do you, how do these artists get paid and how do they survive? It seems the, the model is to get known on social and then <laughs> use that to, to book gigs. But then there's a the publishing aspect, like you said, and you're kind of, you're, and you end up being your own publicist, your own manager and, and navigating that as a sort of a minefield. Yeah. I mean, if you, even if you successfully do all those things, like the math doesn't work out, you know, like we are headed, you know, the, the bottom line is, is like streaming does not pay enough, even to the people who are successful on it to, right. you know, support a family. Like it's it just, it, it just flat out doesn't work out. And we're, you know, a lot of things, you know, you look at Apple, you look at Amazon Music, those are lost leaders under this huge big umbrella of a tech company. You look at Spotify, they haven't had a profitable quarter ever. You know, they've been like propped up by like VC money and that sort of thing. So even if they upped, you know, their their streaming out payouts, it still doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. We're still doing the math problems as though people are buying physical product and exactly. you know, and 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 that like at some point 
you know, it's, the music's gonna stop. Like at some point we're all gonna look up and be like, okay, we've all been pretending this math works out, but it, it doesn't. And so that's the thing that I just really hope, um, you know, it's now my generation that are in these positions of leadership and that we all can, you know, have frank discussions about like, you know, we've in video streaming, like there's, they've not uh, compromised the value of their, their art or their product. Like the, the creators in that world are, are getting paid handsomely right, right. Uh, we're the only format where in music where we've put literally everything that's ever existed is available for less than what is you know like hbo max doesn't have every show that's ever existed they just have their own little catalog and i pay more for hbo max than i do for spotify you know exactly. and it's, right. it's the thing where like we we kind of got to you know really reevaluate um but i mean that's not what we're what we're here for you know that's that like we're just trying to like help along the situation as it is but um but yeah the the economics of it really concerned me just because i i love artists i love albums i yeah you want people to be able to survive I, I, and, I want this yeah. to like continue you know and i want um the the generation after me and after that to like know a world where you can you can make a middle class living as an artist as a creator as a you know creative uh contributor to to these projects and so yeah and i, I like i like the middle class i mean there was a quote in your bio about the middle class <laughs> with when related to the app and yeah. uh, and middle class musicians and i think that's true like we need that because you know we have the starving artists we all know that we have the Taylor Swifts, but we need that metal. The middle is important. Absolutely. I mean, we're carpenters. We build stuff. You know, we're yeah, craftsmen. It's, yep. it's really um, a craft, and that's you know, you go into any writing room in this town, like they're they're building something based upon a lot of experience, a lot of skill, and and you know, with a lot of expertise. And so, right. um, you know, I just I, I hope that we work out ways that that people are still going to be inclined to go into the field mm, absolutely yeah it's super important and, and also develop the future that's that's i mean that's where the future is it's right there in that in that middle class working songwriter working artist um zone um tell people how they can find you online and, and also your app okay you can go to ultimate playlist.app um and that's where you can get and that's our our website um so just ultimate playlist.app and that gives you the link to both the App Store and Google Play. So we have both iOS and Android. And then you just download the app and the rest, you know, um, we've we've hopefully built it in an intuitive way that, you know, you're kind of led through the, the registration process and then you just press play and you react and you let us know and give us your, your feedback on songs and your tickets are automatically entered um, for the drawing and you'll hopefully get an email the next day saying that you won a hundred bucks or $500 or $250. And uh, so you can go to ultimate playlist.app for that. Or, um, you know, if you're, if you're super sophisticated, you can go straight to app store and just type in ultimate playlist. Uh, same thing with Google play, you know, we're searchable on those. And uh, yeah, well, I encourage everybody to get in there. Yeah, that's awesome. And so we're going to put links for your website. We'll put links for um, the app website, all that stuff on the uh, episode. And thank you so much for joining us. I, you have such a, a great background that can oh, really is so beneficial for young artists. I think it's super important to get get that information out there. Yeah, I appreciate you giving me the forum to do so. You're doing the same thing. You know, like I think um, really taking the time to have long form conversations and and um, yeah, and the, and let you, you know you're using your creativity and your artistry to make a podcast. You know, like I'm using the same muscles that I've used to like write songs or you know make sculptures. Is I'm just applying that to making an app. So I think that's also something right. for young artists. Like just make stuff, make lots and lots of stuff. And um, yeah, you, know, you just gotta keep gotta keep moving, right? <laughs> you got it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chevy. Have an awesome day in Nashville. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite cities. <laughs> I, I concur. Absolutely. Uh, great. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ciao. Bye.